All right, so here we go with our fifth and final Ultimo part of chapter 15 video lecture. And finally, we get to the age of exploration. So Europe is going to extend its influence throughout the world by exploring the world, particularly the Indian and uh, Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, right? And as they explore the world, they're going to start setting up colonies and trading posts all over the world as well. So let's talk about the age of exploration, right? So here we see in the big map, we see Europe, right? And Europe, their main goal is to explore the East. They want to get to India, they want to get to China, they want to get to Southeast Asia, right? AKA the Spice Islands. And that's what they want, right? And for, for hundreds and hundreds of years, we see the Silk Road had provided supplies, right? So uh, provided the supply of silk and porcelain and spices and cotton uh, and sugar uh, from the East to Europe, right? But by 1450, the Byzantine Empire is gone and the Ottoman Turks have control of this part of the Eastern Mediterranean of the Middle East. And they're going to control because they have a monopoly on the sugar and spice trade, on the porcelain and silk trade. That means all the goods from Asia have to go through the Ottomans. And then the Ottomans, they sell it to the Italians. And then the Italians sell it to the rest of Europe. That means it's gonna, when the time it gets to the rest of Europe, it's gonna be super, super, super expensive. So the Europeans, especially the ones all the way in the Western end, uh, in the Iberian Peninsula of Portugal and Spain, they're going to say, forget the Italians, forget their monopoly, that's unfair. What if we sail directly to East Asia? What if we sail directly to the East, to Asia, right? So the Portuguese are going to start their explorations, right? And it's all about resources. It's all about direct trade. They're tired of the Turkish-Italian or a Turkish Venetian monopoly, right? They wanted to trade directly with Asia to get better prices and get better goods. On top of that, Spain and Portugal, remember, they just finished the Reconquista by 1492, right? So by the time that Columbus is ready to sail and the Portuguese explorers are ready to sail, the Spanish and the Portuguese, they're all hyped up about their faith about Catholicism. They want to spread Catholic faith everywhere they go. And they're going to be looking for resources as well. These are the motivations of the Europeans, right? Gold, God, and glory. Those are the famous three G's of exploration. Gold, God, and glory. Now, when they're going to, when we talk about resources, yes, we talk about gold, but Slaves will be a resource as well. We'll talk about that more in a future chapter. Now, how were the Europeans able to sell? Remember, Europe was economically, culturally, scientifically, you know, kind of like backwards, stagnant. They weren't really improving during the post-classical era after the fall of the Roman Empire. But by 1450, a lot of cultural diffusion had taken place. Naval technology from the Indian Ocean spread into the Mediterranean, spread into Europe, right? Stuff like uh, compasses and rudders and astrolabs. Knowledge of how to track wind currents and ocean currents, right? And the Europeans are learning this stuff for hundreds of years. They've been developing this knowledge. And by the late 1400s, right, by the start of the early modern era, the Europeans are ready to explore, right? But again, they have they fuse, they have learned from other cultures, right? And now they're ready to set sail. And here you see some of those technologies, right? Now, the most impressive one of, uh, that we haven't talked about before is this ship right here is called the Caravel. And it was a Portuguese Spanish ship. Uh, and it was basically the, the top of the line, most technologically advanced ship in the, during this time period. They were small. But they were durable, meaning that they were able to sustain, you know, traveling long distance over the ocean, right? They were sustaining the impact of waves crashing on them, right? Um, and all this technology, again, will allow the Europeans to set sail. 
Later on, we see another ship called the Galleons. Right? These are more massive ships, larger ships. These are cargo ships. And the Spanish are going to have a fleet of these ships transporting their goods across the ocean. Now, the first explorers that we see are going to be the Portuguese. And the Portuguese, again, they are tired of paying high prices for their, for their goods, uh, high prices to the Ottomans and the Venetians. They want to have their direct routes, right? And they want to go, they figure, we can sail around Africa and make our way to India. And the first sailor of these uh, is Bartolomeu Diaz, right? So he sails, right? And they sail across the, you know, and they make stops in West Africa. They make stops over here in East Africa. They make stops in South Africa. And wherever they stop, they make deals with the local leaders and the local rulers and they make business, ships, business partnerships. Uh, they even set up little forts uh, to kind of like restock other ships that are coming in. Uh, eventually, Bartolomeu Diaz reaches all the way here to the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa uh, before his, his sailors decide that he wants to sail back. Uh, a few years later, this other guy, Vasco da Gama, over here, he will you know, continue on where uh, Diaz left off, and he's going to sail all the way past the Swahili city-states over here in East Africa, and he's going to sail all the way to India. And when they come back with that glorious, you know, supply of spices and silks and cotton and gold and ruby and all this other good stuff, right? And, you know, again, they were motivated by this God, glory, and gold stuff. Uh, but by the time they come back, they become rich, right? Because now they have so much supply that they can sell this stuff at a cheap price, right? Cheaper than the Italians and the, and the Ottomans. And the they grow super, super, super rich. And then, then that encourages the English, the French, the Dutch to start their explorations as well. And the Spanish, of course, as well. Right? So the Portuguese, they're going to explore Africa. They're going to reach the Indian Ocean. The Spanish, right? Thanks to Columbus, they're going to go in the opposite direction. They're going to go up west across the Atlantic, making their way to the Americans, right, for the first time. And uh, again, remember, they're Catholic Christians, so they want to spread that. So um, many times the Portuguese would, would trade with the Africans, and they would fight like the Swahili city states. They would fight against the Swahili city states because there were competition, uh, and they would like use their gunpowder technology to conquer. Oh, by the way, if, if you haven't figured it out, the Europeans had the top of the line uh, when it came to weaponry. Right? They had the most advanced weapons because they've been developing these weapons for a very long time. Remember, gunpowder can be traced back all the way to the Crusades, right, in the 1100s, 1200s. Well, by the 1400s, the Europeans have been developing and expanding their knowledge and understanding and, and sophistication of gunpowder technology, gunpowder weapons. So by the time they're exploring the late 1400s, early 1500s, they have the best weapons around, right? Weapons on their ships, weapons on their soldiers, and therefore they're going to always have a technological advantage when it comes to conflict and war and conquest. So the Portuguese are going to explore Africa's coast, they're going to build these trading posts, and then uh, here and there they're going to fight uh, whenever they had to fight. But their goal was always India, right? That's where they wanted to go to, because that's where the rich, <laughs> the riches were. So um, they forced their way, by the way. Uh, you know, so they would you know, use their gunpowder to intimidate uh, and eliminate any competition. So by the 1500s, the, the Portuguese have control most of the Indian Ocean, which is a big change in world history, because if you remember, throughout um, all of the history of the Indian Ocean Trade Network, there was never was conflict. There was always more cooperation between all the different trading partners that were there. But now the Europeans kind of forced their way in there and say, you got to trade with us or else we'll shoot you. And most people, of course, got shot. Um, the Europeans, uh, the Portuguese were gonna be the first ones to pick up slaves as well. Uh, and we're gonna talk more about the slave trade in another chapter, just understand that the once we, we see the settlements in the Americas, uh, we see that there's gonna be a new demand for slave labor, and that demand is gonna be filled by supply from Africa. And the Portuguese are going to transport slaves from Africa to the Americas to work on these huge plantations. Uh, and these plantations will sell cash crops. Cash crops are stuff that you sell to 
uh, stuff that you grow in order to sell it, right? Sugar and tobacco being the top two cash crops. Coffee and cotton come in uh, later on. And uh, so again, you're not, you know, it's not like a small farm where the farmer is growing enough food for himself and his family. Uh, this is a huge plantation, kind of like latifundias back in ancient Rome. Uh, and they're growing stuff to sell it, right? Sugar and tobacco being the main two. So the Portuguese are going to have their empire, a uh, what is called a trading post empire. So they're going to have all these little tiny territories here and there, right, all over the world, right? So they're going to have, you know, in the Atlantic, they're going to have Brazil, which, of course, is going to be their major colony, but we'll talk about that in another time. Uh, they're going to have territories in Africa, a whole bunch of small city-states, right? But like Mombasa was one of those uh, city-states, Mozambique was another. Uh, and then they're going to have trading posts in India, right? And then in Southeast Asia, and even the, to Japan. Right? They're going to trade in Japan, they're going to trade in Macau, which is in China. Right, so these this is what we call a trading post empire. Right, so they have a lot of territory with the exception of Brazil, uh, but they're going to have little islands and territories and cities all over the world. Around the same time that the uh, Portuguese Empire is establishing, the Spanish Empire is also going to establish. And you kind of notice the difference here. They're not so much a trading post empire uh, because they kind of strike the the lottery. They win the lottery when it comes to conquest. Because when they get to the Americas, right, uh, they will be able to conquer the two biggest, baddest, wealthiest empires in the Americas. That's the Aztecs and the Incas. Our right, Aztecs will be up here. Uh, the Incas will be all up here. And basically steal all their wealth from them. Um, so the Spanish Empire, even though it, is, it has trading posts like you see here uh, in Africa, uh, we call this a maritime empire because their territories were across the seas, right, across the oceans. Uh, and it all starts with Columbus, of course, who sails in 1492. Uh, he's actually an Italian. Uh, some historians argue that he's probably a Jewish Italian, which is weird. Uh, but he gains support from the Spanish government. He sets sail. Uh, and, of course, you know, he's accompanied by Jesuit missionaries and stuff like that. So he sails, you know, west across the Atlantic. He reaches the Americas. Uh, he dies before realizing what he found. Uh, but, you know, eventually the Spanish will conquer this entire, you know, most of these two continents. Uh, then there's another guy called Magellan. He's going to sail um, across or underneath South America, like Argentina and Chile down here. And he's going to sail across the Pacific and land over here in the Philippines, right, in Southeast Asia. And this guy is called Magellan. Uh, and he's going to say, Southeast Asia, this, these islands of the Philippines, this now belongs to Spain. So they conquer it. Uh, but he dies there, but whatever, his crew continues sailing. And they sail across the Indian Ocean, they sail underneath Africa, and they make their way back home to Spain. And in doing so, uh, he becomes the first, he's giving credit, even though he didn't make the whole trip, but he's giving credit of circumnavigating. In other words, going around the entire Earth. And, of course, this put the end to the stupid debates about whether or not the Earth was flat. By the way, Columbus and most of Europe, they already knew the Earth was round. They've known it since the ancient, you know, since the Greeks and the Romans. They've known it since the Arabs had, you know, determined that as well. So it wasn't really that much of a big debate. Uh, but regardless, Magellan had put it, the end to this, um, uh, to that debate. Uh, so the, the Spanish, again, they're going to conquer the Aztecs and conquer the Incas down here. Uh, and they're also going to have a merit, again, they're going to have a maritime empire. Um, and the Philippines, again, will be conquered. Uh, and, you know, most of the people there will be converting to Catholicism. And in fact, even to this day, a lot of the uh, people of the Philippines are Catholics. All right, Netherlands is next. The Dutch, right, those are the Netherlands. Uh, the Dutch and the English, they share a similar quality in the sense that they are pretty much more interested about making money and acquiring resources than they are about converting people. And mainly because they're Protestants, so they're not, they don't have that determination to convert people like the Catholics might have had, especially after the uh, Protestant Reformation, the Catholic Reformation. So they tend to just kind of like trade. Uh, and the Dutch, more so than the English, they tend to have better relations, uh, even though, of course, sometimes they fought. Uh, with the, the locals, with the tribes. Uh, but generally speaking, the Dutch were kind of nicer 
Um, but in the end, you know, they still conquered and took over. So maybe not so nice. Uh, so the English and the Dutch, they're going to have trading posts. Uh, they're going to have trading post empires all over the world. And we see that sometimes the government is going to help in these setting up and funding and investing these trading posts. Uh, and sometimes it's going to be businesses, companies that are set up. Uh, so, for example, there's two famous companies. Uh, the first one is called the VOC or the Dutch East India Company. And they're going to have all these different trading posts all over the Indian Ocean. All over, you know, they go from Japan to the East Indies or the Southeast Asia, the Spice Islands, right? China, India, Arabia, right? Um, so the, and here we see the, the big thing. So Amsterdam is the capital of the Netherlands. Uh, and they're going to have, you know, they're going to be sailing back and forth from Europe to the Indian Ocean, uh, controlling trade. And they're actually going to push the Portuguese out of the way. But this is called the Dutch East India Company or the VOC, because uh, that's the initials in Dutch. And the Dutch East India Company, again, they're going to control a lot of uh, territory, but not so much land, but more like wealth, you know, and resources and trade networks and stuff like that. And the VOC and the, you know, the Dutch East India Company, they're going to work side by side with the Dutch government, right? Uh, so whenever the VOC needed military support, the Dutch would back them up. Whenever the government needed, you know, money and bank loans, the VOC will step in, uh, so it was a mutual beneficial beneficial territory. Uh, Southeast Asia, they're going to be dominated by different um, European countries. Uh, so by the late 1700s, we're going to see, you know, that the French, the British, the Spanish, uh, the the Portuguese, the Dutch, they're all going to be involved in Southeast Asia. Now the Dutch VOC again, we we're talking about them just now. They are going to control the spice trade out of Southeast Asia, out of this region called Java is an island. Uh, so a lot of the spices, stuff like cinnamon and tea, uh, are going to be monopolized, meaning the Dutch are going to control the production of these spices. And anyone who wants to buy these spices has to buy from the Dutch, and therefore the Dutch can put whatever price that they want. Uh, so the VOC is actually going to have a monopoly. And in doing so, we're going to see that the Netherlands are going to grow super, super, super rich uh, from all this trade control that they're going to have. All right. Uh, England and France. So uh, a few things to notice here. We see England and France up here. Uh, the English and the French are going to have a lot of territories pretty much everywhere uh, based on the explorers. Now, when it comes to the English, probably one of the most famous explorers is this guy called James Cook. All right, not Hook, like Peter Pan Hook. But Captain Cook, uh, and he is going to sail around the world he's gonna, uh, for a whole bunch of years. And he is going to, um, he's like 20 something years out at sea. Uh, and he's going to be uh, in, he's going to map the Pacific Islands and Oceania, right? So all the way over here, all the way over here. In fact, he is given credit uh, for, for discovering, quote unquote, of course, you know, people live there for instance forever. But discovering uh, places like Australia and New Zealand and Hawaii. Uh, and he actually dies in Hawaii. Anyways, uh, so the British, their trading post empire, uh, they're going to have territories everywhere, right? India, Africa, Southeast Asia, and the Americas. And the British are also going to have the East India Company, uh, just like the Dutch, and they're going to be working together. And in fact, the British East India Company and the British government are going to work together uh, to eventually conquer India, which happens in time period five in the 1800s. Um, but the, pro the, the the beginnings are take place here in the early modern era. Uh, and the British are always going to be fighting against the Europeans, uh, whether it's the Dutch, the French, the Spanish, the Portuguese, and they're always going to be fighting over territories. All right, uh, so here we see the British Empire. Again, they have North America, they have Canada, 13 American, American colonies. They have a few colonies here in the Caribbean. They have a few colonies in Africa, uh, in India, and uh, eventually they're going to expand and become the largest empire in world history, but ha that happens in the next time period. Um, so lots of fighting, lots of conflicts, right? These Europeans, instead of fighting themselves uh, or against each other in Europe, they're going to fight against each other in other parts of the world. 
Uh, so the Portuguese and the Dutch, they're going to fight in Southeast Asia. Uh, the French and the English, right? I'm sure you've studied the Seven Years' War, the French and Indian War, right? That is a big international conflict between France and England all over the world, including North America and India. And all these conflicts, right, they're all about trade, they're all about colonies. Uh, and kind of the end result is by, by the end of this time period, of the 1750, uh, England kind of gains control of a lot of territories and a lot of trade networks. Um, here's a picture of the uh, French and Indian War, also known as the Seven Years' War. Um, and England kind of becomes the big winner. Uh, France kind of becomes the big loser in all these battles. Um, and British regained hegemon hegemony or dominance uh, in a lot of its colonies, North America and India. Uh, so the British would be the big winner. The French would be the big loser, uh, even though they have you know territories here and there um, from all these fighting. So this is the French territories. Again, the, you know this the, most of this Africa stuff will come later on. Uh, but the French at one point controlled, you know, a part, big chunk of North America, uh, they call Louisiana and Quebec, a big chunk of India, right, Haiti over here, right, in the Caribbean, uh, Vietnam as well. And eventually they're going to have territories all over Africa. But that comes later on. So anyways, um, all this expansion, all this war, right, is, you know, it, at the same time that the French and the English are fighting, we see the rise of the power of the centralized monarchs, right, uh, from all these fightings and all this trade, uh, controlling of trade, um, and uh, France will uh, eventually create its own little empire. All right, last thing we're going to talk about is global trade. So for the first time in world history, we have a global trade network where stuff from all the continents are going to be exchanged for other stuff. Right, and this exchange only occurs during this early modern era um, because it's the first time that the Americas are going to be included with the rest of the trade networks and um, trade you know, networks of exchange uh, that we had seen and develop in the previous time periods. Uh, so the Atlantic is going to be the new central trade network. Right? It's going to kind of, uh, Indian Ocean is still there. Uh, the spike, Spice Roads are still there, but they're going to weaken. The Trans-Saharan Roads are, are still there, but they're going to weaken. Right, but the new Atlantic trade network, what is called the triangular trade, that's going to increase. So that's going to become more and more and more important. And this starts all in the 1500s after the discovery of the Americas. Right, and it is a triangular trade. Uh, so we see uh, goods, raw goods, uh, stuff like sugar and tobacco going to Europe. Uh, finished goods like textiles, clothing, uh, weapons, manufactured goods, they're going to go to Africa and slaves are going to go to the Americas, right? But this triangular trade, I'm sure some of you have heard of this one already, uh, this is going to be this big global network because it's going to link to the other parts of, you know, Asia um, and the Pacific Islands and Oceania. Uh, big change, as you mentioned before, is that the Indian Ocean is going to get dominated by the Europeans, mainly because the Europeans had that trade, had that uh, gunpowder, you know, technology, uh, so Healy city states, they're going to uh, lose, you know, they're going to be destroyed. Muslim merchants are going to uh, lose a lot of their territory. Uh, Southeast Asian merchants are going to lose a lot of their territory as they're going to get conquered by the Europeans. Uh, the Trans-Pacific trade, right, this kind of linked the Atlantic to the Pacific and the Spanish were the ones doing this. So the Spanish will get all the silver and gold from the Americas put it on their boats, on their ships, called the galleons, these big cargo ships, sail them across the Pacific uh, from Mexico to the Philippines. They'll get to the Philippines and they'll, you know, trade out gold and silver, uh, mainly silver, uh, for porcelain and silk and other goods that the Chinese have. And then they'll sail it back to Mexico. Uh, and then from Mexico, it will be sent to Europe, sent to Spain. Uh, so the Chinese are still going to be the wealthiest country, even though Spain is kind of like rising up there uh, during this time period. And the um, the, the Spanish, again, are, they're going to have control of this trans-Pacific trade network. Lots of wealth. And here you see the map, right? So all the silver that's coming out of the Andes Mountains, they're going to send it to Mexico. From Mexico, it'll go to the Pacific, uh, across the Pacific, to the Philippines. They'll trade with China. 
uh, the you know silver for other goods, then they'll sail back to Mexico, and then from here they'll send it to Spain, right? Part of that triangular trade network. Uh, so that is it for our fifth and final, whew, final uh, video lecture. Thank you for watching and listening and learning. And that's it. Go to bed. <laughs>